God of the universe, maker of the stars, who am I? Hello, everyone. Sorry we weren't online last week, but there was a lot of things going on. We do have the Feast of Tabernacles that's happening as, oh, wait a minute. It's just me and Daniel recording. Why? Because <laughs> the uh, the guys from the because Exodus Road Band, uh, David and Ryan, they're over enjoying themselves at uh, Elijah Clark State Park in uh, the great state of uh where is that south carolina yeah and i'm getting ready to head to florida myself uh tomorrow and of course daniel you've had a little bit of an excuse for kind of being out of touch what's <laughs> yeah okay, come on man up tell us about it yeah so i uh i just i, I got like some i ate too much sushi had some bad food poisoning i was laid out for about six days i'm totally kidding um no we uh we finally got our little baby that we've been talking about for you know several weeks now um peter cody clayton uh he came into the world on october 2nd i believe it is i mm -hmm. i think that's true i mean yeah. I, I only I, i'm only 50 percent confident in anything i say right now i remember um, it because it, uh, <laughs> at uh at three o'clock in the morning on october 2nd my uh my phone rang and uh that was basically a message to wake up my wife and go back to sleep which is what i did <laughs> Yeah, it must have been nice, right? It was. No, um, <laughs> no, it was good. Um, healthy baby, healthy mama. Um, not much sleep, so you know, but that's that's part of it. Um, um, we're you know we're gonna be pausing kind of our uh, the messages we've been going through with the other guys, but it's gonna be fun to get to it because the next question we're doing is what have you been given? Mm -hmm. And I think I could probably tie in a couple things, you know, regarding you know, what you've been given as far as yeah. like maybe a child or something like there that. <laughs> uh, looking forward to that. Um, but no, this has, it's, it's made a very unique fall festival time for me. Uh, did much different than I've ever done. Um, you know, we didn't, I didn't even fast for Yom Kippur, which I know just made some people's heads explode, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't. Um, but you know, what? I was, I was consoled by the father because it doesn't actually say to not eat so we um we did our best to make the day special you know yeah. we we set some things apart in fact from certain things mm -hmm. um but you know brand new baby no sleep three other kids definitely needed some energy there um <laughs> so yeah the very different fall festival season for me for sure yeah yeah and uh you uh i heard you got your your suka up just a little while ago yeah yeah um the uh the kids helped me with it they had a, yeah, a super easy one but man they just think it's the best when they can help with something it was just, oh, yeah. it was a good time yeah, that's the coolest thing. It's uh, yeah. yeah, it made my life much more much much more difficult and complicated when you moved out, because now I have that's to do everything me, myself. Right? <laughs> and that's why you came to North Carolina. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Well, hey, we want to. Uh, we're going to take this week and next week. It's going to be a couple of shorter programs, uh, just because it's going to be myself and and you, and uh, mm -hmm. with all the stuff that you've got going on, what I that I have. But uh, at the same time, we wanted to do a, a broadcast, and so we're going to go to maybe what seems to be a little random as far as our subjects for this week and next week, in and in, in break into the the five questions with with something different. Uh, this week, though, we want to talk about something that is, uh, th this is not original to me. It is a, from a message that I heard probably back about, uh, it was my BD days, uh, B before Daniel. Uh, the dark days. Yeah. It uh, was probably pro in the 1987, I think. And I heard a youth pastor stand up and talk about uh, a, a number of concepts, but the the one thing that stood out for me was this, that each one of us has to have our own crisis of faith. Now, I, I've, I've, I taught that to you as, as you were growing up. Uh, expound on, on those words in your, uh, in your thoughts. Yeah, um, you know, there was a lot of experience behind those things. Um, you know, lots of different moments when you brought it up throughout my life. Um, and I think another another good phrase to pair with it, which you also told me a lot, was that God does not have grandchildren. Yeah. He only has sons and daughters. And that one in particular has really, really stuck with me over the years because, you know, it taught me in my, you know, coming into adulthood years 
that I could not rely on you. I could not rely on mom. I couldn't rely on anyone Mm -hmm. for my own faith. And I think that is something we've been kind of touching on the last few weeks. Um, You know, I know Dave, part of David's testimony was, you know, he had relied too heavily on the faith of his parents. And, you know, when it came time for his crisis of faith, you know, it was a pretty serious one. Um, So, yeah, you know, just that knowing that I had to make serious, but not necessarily knowing how. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there was this, this, there was this time, you know, as I came into understanding that I needed to understand things, because when you're a kid, you don't really, you don't know that you need to know things. You just kind of walk through it and that's fine. Um, okay. But, you know, coming into my teenage years. <laughs> um, you I didn't know, know I needed to, to know. <laughs> exactly. Seriously. Like, and man, I wish we could just stay there. You know, how awesome would that be? Just. And I mean, you know, there's, that's a whole message in itself, yeah. uh, being like a child, but, you know, going through various experiences, um, being in different environments, um, you know, whether that was in heavy Jewish area, my beliefs were a little different or heavy Christian areas where my beliefs were different from them or areas completely without, God. you know, my faith was clearly different from them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just coming to understand that okay i have to figure out what i believe and why i believe it um so you know when we say crisis of faith that's essentially what it is like coming to the point where your faith becomes your own coming Mm -hmm. to the point where it's challenged enough that um you know you either it's a make it or break it moment you know you enter that crisis and you either get through it or you don't and there's plenty of people that don't get through it and there's plenty of people that mm-hmm. do. And the other one liner that I'll, uh, lead, I'll shoot this one over to you after that is um, a man with experience is not at the mercy of a man with an opinion. And so once you get through your crisis of faith, that's what you have to look forward to is like, mm-hmm. you're not phased by the people who have an opinion about what you've gone through or what you've mm-hmm. experienced. So, you know, what about you? Like, as far as, you know, when you hear crisis of faith, like, how do you define that for other people? Well, let me, let me go to your, your, uh, your last one liner there. Uh, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument either. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people just want to argue about their experiences in life of what they've gone through of what they think they believe and whatever. And, uh, when you have something that's real to you, when mm-hmm. you can point to a moment in time and say, this moment, this experience changed my life, defined my life. Mm-hmm. This is who I was then. And this is who I was the day. This is who I am the day after. Uh, it's very difficult to argue with that. Now, some mm-hmm. people will argue just because they like to argue. But, um, you know, Proverbs talking about, you know, arguing with a, a fool uh, is yes, just a not lot. really a good idea. But, um, you know, for me, uh, I had never heard that until after I had a crisis of faith, mm-hmm. my own. Uh, my life of growing up in a, a home in which I uh, I watched the the faith of my grandmother uh, I was just reading the uh, on Yom Kippur. I actually read the books of Timothy and Titus, and mm-hmm. uh, was was reminded once again of the the verse that Timothy said, the uh, the faith that was in you that was there from your uh, your mother and your grandmother. Um, and, and it starts with an L. I can't remember the name. Lola, I think it is. Well, my grandmother's name was Lona, and I actually mm-hmm. used that verse. Uh, the day that I that I I, uh, I officiated her funeral mm. in um, back in 1992 wow. in Sop Chapi, and so I rely I saw her faith, but yet when it came to that point in time of life that I had to make some decisions, uh, I failed, mm. uh, and and it wasn't really that I was failing on purpose. Mm-hmm. I was more failing by default. Because there was no one, you know, we didn't have podcasts back then. Um, We didn't have cell phones. In fact, we never lost our phones back then because they were always plugged into the wall. Okay. That's how bad that was. But um, you always knew where it was. Uh, 
different subject. So I, there was there was no teaching then to drive me to that point of, and there was no one in my life that understood the concept. And and this is this is maybe the most important thing for me regarding this in teaching it is for you right now, you're, you're getting, you know, you're raising a family. Um, others that, uh, that are listening to this, they have maybe young children. Some are looking forward to, you know, long, to children in the future. Uh, setting yourself, your, your children up for a crisis of faith. When I reached my, I, I guess we could call it my second opportunity for a crisis of faith there was someone in, that the father had brought into my life that could help me in that mm -hmm. and and it was there that i on purpose passed that crisis mm -hmm. the test of that crisis mm -hmm. but as a as a parent this is something that i actively tried to do with with all of our children uh, you're you're the one that you know we're talking right now. Uh, can can you, as I say, I actively tried to place those words into your life. Do you remember anything that would kind of back that up, or or how does that? What do those words mean at that point? Well, you know, I, I think it's important to kind of uh, you know just kind of augment what you're saying, you know, by by just explicitly saying. In, in case you already did and I just missed it somehow, but we need to be putting, you know, allowing, these are not bad things, you know, crisis yeah. of faith is not a bad thing, you know, yeah. it's, it's necessary. And, you know, I think back and I don't know if there's any particular moment that I could define the crisis of faith, but it was more that there was lots of situations that I was allowed to be in that sculpted that crisis of faith, you know, you know, like I was saying, where, whether it was like a heavily, you know, Christian area, kind of, you know, divvy out what I believed over there or a heavy Jewish area where I had to, you know, kind of separate those things. Mm -hmm. You know, those were situations that I was allowed to be in, you know, as someone who was under your household, under your covering. And I would think that some parents would not necessarily put your kids in that situation. And let me let me actually um, I'll, I'll give an example that maybe will help here where. I'm not going to say what the situations were or where I was, but I was in two different places where there was lots of different people, um, young people, adults, you know, there was opportunities for, let's just say promiscuity or whatever. Um, you know what, you know, there's always, you can make opportunities. So these two different places handle it in very different ways. Yeah. One of them told the young people, you're going to fail. And so we're going to put rules in place to where you can't fail mm -hmm. because we're going to be watching you so diligently and make sure that you never come even close to stepping out of line. The other one said, these are the rules. You guys can do it. I believe and I expect you to follow these rules. And, you know, which one do you think promotes a higher character growth? Definitely the one, in my opinion, that encourages you that you can maintain, um, you know, being above reproach and making the right choices because he's saying he believes in you. He's not saying you're going to fail. He says, I believe in you, that you can rise up to this. And so being put in those situations where you have to make your choices, you have to uphold standards, because if you never are in a situation where you have to uphold your own standard, then everyone else is always doing it for you. And this, I think, you know, a very simple example for this is kind of the statistics regarding children and teenagers and alcohol, you know, where, you know, the statistics, the statistics will show you that children who are raised in homes that alcohol is like, you know, not a taboo subject, you know, they talk about it, you know, maybe the kids are allowed to drink some, you know, they don't go crazy after they leave the house. But we're talking about a sip of wine like, on Shabbat, okay? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that's what we're saying. You know, where it's not like, um, you know, alcohol is not the devil. And so, but I would I would think you can see pretty easily that you know, children, teenagers who are raised in those homes, the second they go out to college, they go absolutely nuts because something mm -hmm. that was forbidden that they weren't that were tested in now it's everywhere, and there's no there's no uh, 
boundaries to it. There's nothing withholding them from doing it. And so, yeah, I, I'm, hopefully that example actually came off well. <laughs> so, yeah. So let's go back to the example of the two different places. Maybe mm-hmm. there's a place kind of somewhere a little right of center mm-hmm. that would be the, the the most appropriate there, that you have clear-cut boundaries, but yet you have clear-cut guidance with a positive approach that you have the ability to stand within these boundaries and 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 also to speak of why are these boundaries here mm-hmm. you know what why is what's the purpose why did the father place these boundaries mm-hmm. uh we're, we're talking about you know intimacy um you know why did he place that and we're going to probably do programs in the future regarding this mm-hmm. but you know to teach a not just a young woman but also a young man that if you going back to our identity thing if you treat yourself like a pawn shop watch mm-hmm. you're going to end up in the trash you know, you go into a jewelry store. Uh, you you can go to uh, I, there's a, a jewelry store in Israel that uh, a friend of mine owns, and he has this beautiful jewelry. You know where it's at on the right hand side there, going up mm-hmm. Benihuda Street. Yep. He has this beautiful jewelry out in in the front, but then he has his safe in the back. That's where the stuff that's really valuable is. Mm-hmm. So if you set boundaries, but with the explanation you know are you putting yourself out there on the showroom window in in Mm -hmm. the in the in the showcase out on the on the street for the sun to shine on for the dust to lay on or are you looking at yourself like a fine piece of jewelry that's hidden in the back safe that only the most important people those that would respect that piece of jewelry would get to see. So Mm -hmm. somewhere there in the middle of this, or maybe, as I said, a little bit right of, and I'm not going to say to people which side I'm going right of, but Mm -hmm. setting the boundaries. And then on the other hand, for those, you know, the, in the, the place that they're kind of like, okay, we trust you. You still have to set boundaries. Yeah, for but, sure. But then when you set the boundaries, you must enforce the boundaries. Mm-hmm. And and this is where I uh, I've seen tragic things happen in which there are we, we have a youth camp or something like that. There are boundaries that are set on paper, mm-hmm. but then they're not enforced. Mm-hmm. And and in a, a non-enforced boundary is very similar to a non-enforced, you know, if, if you got a speed limit, like going down to uh, to Hula Falls or down to Atlanta, I got to go through there tomorrow. Uh, they've always had, you know, you know where I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. They, there's that school zone right there. And they've got signs all over the place for school zones. And they put up flashing lights. And, and finally, they put up the other day a speed camera. I think that's the only speed camera in North Georgia. But uh, they put up a speed camera there, and um, uh, by the way, Keo's wife got got uh, ticketed go, both going to Atlanta and coming back from Atlanta. Oh, no. um, <laughs> and so, what does this do? This is you weren't listening to the boundary. Mm-hmm. You weren't acknowledging. You weren't walking in the boundary that we put up with the sign. And so we're going to now go to another step and we're going to put up a flashing light. You're still not adhering to the boundary. So now we're going to put a speed cam. Mm -hmm. And if you continue to, to not adhere to this boundary, it's going to cost you. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they need the money. No, it's about the safety of someone. Mm -hmm. It's about the ruining of someone's life when you don't, walk within the boundaries Mm -hmm. and that ties right back to our subject 
Yeah, because, you know, I was, I was just thinking here, like, okay, just making sure we can tie this back. And, you know, what we're doing right now, we're not necessarily talking about the crisis of faith right now, but the context with which to put someone into it or mm-hmm. the context with which someone is put into it. Because, mm-hmm. you know, those boundaries, those uh, views and enforcements of the boundaries, that's not the crisis of faith. But that is, you know, maybe as a parent, you would see one of those situations and you would be like, okay. I'm looking at the boundaries here. I'm looking at how these people enforce them. I feel comfortable putting my child there where they can, you know, maybe come into their own crisis of faith. And, you know, this, this is, you know, we're using the, you know, the the example we've been using, but when it comes to faith, like, you know, it's a little different where, and let me just kind of go into my own personal example. Cause the, the biggest, I guess, I can't remember the biggest moment that I can remember as far as what my crisis of faith would have been was the tornado. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, got hit by a tornado in 2010. Um, you know, we got into our uh, storm shelter and we were in there for, I don't exactly know how long, you know, about you can three never really, about three of them. Yeah. Maybe three and a half, <laughs> um, you know, but maybe it was, maybe it was two minutes. Maybe it wasn't even two yeah. minutes. It's really hard to say. Um, but we came out and I just saw that I had never witnessed with my own eyes, such devastation, mm-hmm. you know, such wreckage. And so my first thought as a 15 year old was, God, why would you let this happen to us? Mm -hmm. Like we haven't done anything wrong that I can think of, you know, anything majorly wrong. You know, we've been following your commandments, you know, observing our Passovers and our Sukkots and, you know, praying and all this stuff. And so, but my first thought walking out of that thing was, you know, God, why would you let this happen? You know, walking around our house, the roof's off over here. All these buildings are totally trashed. You know, the only, the very first spot that leaked water in the house that first night was directly over my head in the bed. That was the first spot. <laughs> I'm not even exaggerating. Yeah, I woke I, up. I remember that now. Some, yeah. some Chinese water torture there. Um, and so, you know, for a 15 year old, you know, that, that's, it, um, it was interesting to deal with, you know, just mm-hmm. seeing our lives kind of torn apart in that way. Um, and so we kind of entered this dreamlike state for a little while. You know, we were just kind of floating around doing what needed to be done. We were on autopilot kind of fixing things. And then, um, I, see, you know, I we called were... it the kitty box syndrome. Oh. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. It was, I do it was like now. being in a huge cat box with massive mountains of cat litter, knowing you need to do something, but not quite figuring out where to scratch. Mm hmm. Yeah, it, that, it really that might have I mean, been too much of a picture for people, but that's this how I felt. maybe so. But it, it works. It works. It gets the job done, just like the cats get the job done. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so we were just on autopilot mode, you know, floating around, and you know, what what do we do here? And you know, that was the status of our lives for at least a couple months, you know, yeah. probably longer. And so, you know, I entered into this space of you know, not really doubting God because I didn't feel like it was something big enough to doubt God over, but it was definitely like, you know, why did this happen? You know, it feels like this was unnecessary. And so I remember, you know, we got in our own, tra- you know, you guys, uh, you and mom had a travel trailer and I had a travel trailer. Um, you were smart enough to, you know, let us have our own space for a little while. <laughs> and that, I remember that was also wisdom and I wisdom, didn't want you in go. the same fifth wheel applied experience. There we go. Um, so I spent a lot of time in that travel trailer, just me and my guitar that I was not good at at the time. I knew how to play a few songs. I still had not learned how to play and sing together. Um, very frustrating for me. And so I remember praying a lot in that trailer, though. I prayed specifically like, God, if you hear me, please let me know. Yeah. And that was the most simple and most powerful prayer. Everything I else else I prayed in that time was probably a little more just like noise, but that was the meat of that time. And you fast forward um, to Sukkot following that. So the tornado was in May, Sukkot of 2010, the same yeah. year. Um, you know, we're over at Sportsman's Lake in Oklahoma. Uh, Barry Phillips was out there and he's talking on the last night and he's he's telling the story about this this guitar that, you know, that he's been playing throughout the week, gorgeous guitar, electric, it's electric, um, you know, beautiful blonde color. The shape is nice. It's just, it's just a nice looking guitar. Um, 
And so he's, he starts telling the story about this guitar because he had worked at a music shop and they were trying to sell this guitar. Um, well, it was given. Let, let me put it one thing in. This guitar is very special in that it was owned by Dr. Zakina, mm-hmm. who is an Inuit Indian chief, a uh, very amazing man. And he had given that guitar to Barry mm-hmm. and Barry had put it in there and tried to sell it at that store. Go ahead. And so, yeah, so he had that guitar and he's trying to sell it. And, you know, mind you, everything that I'm saying right now, Barry was saying at that moment at the lake, we were all there. I was listening to him and he's telling the story and he was out on his porch praying one day, you know, just going through various things. And he prayed, you know, you know, father, why isn't that guitar selling? You know, gorgeous guitar. It's been sitting there for a while. We've marked the price down a couple of times maybe. And he heard pretty clearly that he said, um, that guitar is not selling because it belongs to Daniel. And I don't, I prefer acoustic guitars. It's not like it's the thing I would have chosen, Mm -hmm. but it's, it wasn't about even what it was necessarily. Like I still, I have that guitar. I value it. I love it, but it's not about what it was. You know, when I look back, like that was God's answer because God spoke to Barry who I looked up to and who I respected and told him that something he had belonged to me and so that was God saying I know your name mm-hmm. I hear your prayers and so that was that was at least a section a big section of my crisis of faith where I can look back to that moment right now and know like you know I can never doubt whether God hears me or not because of that moment yeah. you know I remember that, that you were, you know, you said, because I knew that I knew the story was unfolding when I invited Barry and Laura to come to our Sukkot, because he called me, he told me, he says, this is what's going to happen while we're there. Uh, I didn't so much know your prayer of, you know, you were literally praying, praying, God, do you know me? Do you know my name? Do you know where I am? Yeah. And when Barry said to you, God wants you to know, he knows your name. He knows who you are and he handed you that guitar. Uh, You know, this is the crisis of faith is a wonderful thing to be a part of, you know, the tornado for all, for me, you, your mom, uh, for everybody involved was a crisis of faith. We saw people fail that. We saw us being put into a crisis of faith and people failed. Um, yeah. in various ways, I won't go into that, you know, but then there were others that passed the test, um, that we still, we still walk with today and, um, people will come up to me even today. I was talking to someone the other day that said, uh, you know, I remember being uh, introduced to you during the tornado, the first video I, in fact, Chris Sharp, Chris and Sarah, the first video they ever saw me do was the the one uh, of the the tornado. And now they're, you know, some of our closest friends, part of our congregation. Um, it, it's an amazing thing because people will say, oh, what a terrible thing that was. And I look at them and say, no, that was one of the greatest blessings that ever happened to our family. Yeah. Because it took us into that. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, to watch, to to watch your children, I'm, I'm so, you know, Bill Cloud said this a couple of years ago, one of the greatest blessings is watching your children raise their children. And that is, it's, it's an amazing thing. And I do that with all three of our children, uh, watching them raise their children is something that's beyond words, but to see, you know, to experience that as a father of actually kind of leading your child into that crisis of faith. And then watching them make the right decisions through it. Mm. Wow, that that makes that makes all the other stuff that came along with, uh, you know, with with parenthood really worth it. In the end. Yeah, you know, I th- and I think you know one of the keys here is it, it's really all about perception. Mm-hmm. You know, we we do not see things as our heavenly Father does. Yeah, you know, he where we see, you know, one of the songs I wrote. Um, the, the bridge is like, you know, where, where there is 
desert, you bring forth water. Where there is death, you bring forth life. Where there's chaos, you bring forth order. Mm -hmm. You know, where there's confusion, you bring forth truth. You know, when we see one thing, it's quite possible and almost worth bank banking on sometimes that the spiritual truth is the exact opposite. <laughs> you know, and, I, you know, Paul talks about this, um, you know, and there's various other verses that allude to it where, you know, when we see something as bad, God can both use that for good. And maybe sometimes it is even good, like the tornado, like none of us were harmed. No. None of our animals died. We came out financially on top of that whole situation mm -hmm. because of the favor of God. And I know that's not the case for everybody. And, you know, I, I pray that God would give strength to those people to get through the season and see how he is still good on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. um, but that was, it was a still a bad situation that we looked at, but we looked back at it and it was good. And, mm -hmm. but in the moment, God didn't think it was bad. God mm -hmm. knew the whole time that it was a good situation and that, you know, his hand was upon it. And mm -hmm. so it's really just changing your perception and realizing that any moment could be a crisis of faith. You know, they, they, yeah. they come in scales. There's big ones and little ones and medium ones. And, you know, you could have a crisis of faith in your car when someone cuts you off, like that mm -hmm. could be your little, <laughs> you know, are you going to make the right, are you going to pass that crisis of faith? You know, yeah, they come in all kinds of uh, kinds of things. Hey, Phil, Phil, for thirty seconds while I grab something, just say something yeah. you know, like really intelligent. Okay, and I'll, I'm gonna, and, and I will be watching. I will see what it is because I got to edit this later. Okay, so be careful. All right, I'm gonna go into Crisis of Faith Part Two. So um, I'll have to fill him in a little bit, but the Crisis of Faith Part Two for me um, is it, it revolves around work. Um, when I moved out to North Carolina. I was, you know, working for a contractor and we, there, there was a, a situation where um, he was not able to put as much into the business. There was some family stuff going on. And so I was doing a lot for him and doing a lot of the scheduling and all this kind of stuff. And so I was very up close and personal when, you know, the feeling the weight, when there was five guys that we had to put to work mm -hmm. and no work. And I remember, you know, this moment is just one of the most beautiful ones to me where I'm driving down the road in, in the truck, the guys are working. It's probably either their last day or their second to last day before there's just no work, you know, literally five guys, full times, families to provide for. And I'm just feeling the weight of this thing. And so I'm in the truck, I'm praying, father, please send us work, even if it's one day at a time. And so on the way home, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go stop in and see these people real quick. Um, it's on the way, you know, I, I feel like maybe I had to go look at something maybe, but I walk in there and it's a, it's a store. Um, and so I'm in there just chatting with them a little bit and in walks a client that we had worked for a lot. He hadn't been in town for six months. That was his first day back. And he had just walked in the store and he was like, Hey, you know, how are you guys doing? You know, I'm like, you know, we're doing okay. You know, just kind of briefly explain the situation to him. And he's like, well, you know what? I noticed a bunch of stuff at the house that I need to be fixed. Can you come and look at it? <laughs> Ended up giving us a week of work for multiple guys. And that just kept happening. And I own my own business now. And the construction industry is not the most reliable always when it comes to prolonged work. But how could I ever worry when God has done things like that for me over and over and over again, you know, I get to a Friday and I don't know what I'm doing the next week. And then all of a sudden in an hour, we have the whole week filled. We have two weeks filled, all that kind of stuff. And so mm -hmm. not just putting our children into places of crisis of faith, but putting ourselves into it, putting ourselves into the situations where we have to have faith and we have to become stronger or you're going to be miserable. Yeah, no doubt. I remember those days for you and those uh, really echo the days that I owned a company myself back before mm -hmm. ministry. I had the same uh, basic testimony. So, hey, I want to close the program out. I know you've got uh, uh, a mother-in-law that's kindly taking care of three children, but uh, you do need to get back to the family and wife and uh, new baby. But I just want to read something that um, I think is very appropriate for this program. 
So what are you supposed to do when understanding is far from your grasp? When you want to sleep and it's far out of reach? When you want to feel peace, but inside you're at war? When you say you don't know, but you know that you do know? When you say you're confused, but it's right in front of you? When everything you've done has fallen apart, but for some reason you get up and don't stop? When everything is going against you, but for some unknown reason you keep fighting against the current, what are you supposed to do? When you can't see, but you keep walking. When you can't hear, but you keep trembling or listening. When the sky is falling and the ground is shaking, when the waves are crashing and the trees are bending, all the while you're simply stuck in the middle at the mercy of all that's around you, what are you supposed to do? When all seems hopeless, but somehow you know that it's not, what exactly do you do? Fear not, for when you walk by faith, mountains will move just to make a path for you. Stars will shine brighter just to light the way for you. Oceans will roar just to make a song for you. So fear not, for you will not get what you want when you want it, but you will get what you need when you need it. So fear not, for Yah will guide you. Author, Daniel Clayton, 2012. Your face is leaking. Yeah, a little bit. You know, I need I needed that. I needed that. That's uh that's that's in my office. It's uh part of my decor here. And that went around the world. Mm -hmm. And what it was that was the A after the test. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Guys, don't be afraid of a crisis of faith. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to put someone in one as long as you're there to help them. Yeah. Don't be afraid of the crisis of faith that the Father puts you in because it's for your own good. It's part of, I know the plans for you, for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. So, if you're going through a crisis of faith, be strong. See you next week, Daniel. Amen. Yep. See you next week. God of the universe, maker of